What a beautiful way to begin worship today at Christ Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I'm David Hall, I'm one of the pastors here. Welcome to live stream worship. Pastor Nathan last Sunday opened his sermon by sharing with us how much he's looking forward to the time when we can come back together and worship together as a church in one place. Our bishop and other leaders have uh, asked us not to reopen for a bit and to remain closed. But our church staff is already working on a plan for the time whenever we are able to reopen. We'll follow all the guidelines from the CDC, the Tennessee state governor, and from the bishop. And one of the most important things about that is to safeguard your health by social distancing. And so we need some help from you in order to complete that plan. We've prepared a survey or a poll. This is really, really brief. Literally, you can do it in 20 seconds. That will help us to know which worship service you plan to attend when the time comes for us to reopen. We'd like you to know that whenever we reopen, we're planning to have all four of our Sunday morning services, plus we'll have a Thursday night service that has the same sermon that we have on Sunday morning. We'll be following the state guidelines, which tell us that we can't have children's ministries or nurseries on Sunday morning initially when we open. And those of you who are in the uh, at-risk age bracket or perhaps have a compromising health condition or maybe you just uh, enjoy live stream worship and you're uh, not quite ready to come back, that's fine. In fact, that's one of the options on the survey is to live stream from home. If that's the option that you take initially, please, if that's your, your choice, complete the survey along with the rest of us. The poll is already available on our website, our church app, our social media. In fact, it was in our newsletter this morning. So please, please complete the survey right away. Don't do it right now. If I were you, I'd wait about 20 minutes and do it during the sermon time. That would be perfect. We hope you continue to take advantage of the content that's available on our website and our church app and social media, our weekly newsletter blasts, and all of those are available if you just go to our website and sign up for them. Thank you.
scripture reading today is from the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John. I begin reading at verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
shadow you won't climb up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we sense in this season to abide in your love, that your heart is our home. And in abiding in your love, we experience your gifts into our lives of your peace, of your hope, of your joy, and of your love. We particularly need these gifts in this season of a global pandemic and the experience of the tornadoes around us. As we live into this season, we ask that you would speak peace into our lives following the storms and for our fears. Move us with your hope into a brand new future. Help us to remember that the joy we have that has come from you that's deep inside of us gives us a strength beyond what we thought we had. And by your grace, we are surrounded by your love that is truly unconditional, forgiving, eternal, and life-giving as well. And so we thank you for these gifts and help us not to just keep those inside of us, but to give those to others. And we thank you this day, oh God, for our mothers. And this celebration this day to celebrate our mothers. We ask for your blessings and grace into all the mothers around the world. Somehow, as mothers, we speak a common language of a love for our children. We thank you for the mothers who um, have been mothers, our stepmothers, our grandmothers, our aunts who are like mothers, our Sunday school teachers who are like mothers, all those who have brought your kind of mothering love into our lives. And again, we ask your grace upon them. Some mothers this day have a grief deeper than any grief for the loss of a child along the way. So we ask for your comfort and care into their lives. Many are suffering this day. So we ask that you be the great physician and continue to work your healing power into their lives for those who are sick, to give comfort for those who are grieving, to give a sense of peace and a sense of provision for those who are going through job loss or economic loss that you have a brighter future for them than, than they even realized. 
And Lord, abiding in your home, we thank you so much for the gift of prayer. And we pray together the prayer you continue to teach us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
It is so good to be with you again today in worship. I especially love that opening song today that reminds us there is a tie of Christ's love that binds us together no matter where we are, no matter our situation. I'm glad you're here today with us. Have I ever told you about what happened to me that caused this scar under my chin? You, you didn't know I had a scar under my chin. Well, let me tell you about it. I, I was about five years old. My sister was about three years old at the time, and she was going to be a flower girl in an upcoming wedding of some family friends of ours. Well, we are, were at the apartment of relatives of those friends, and they were going to, uh, she was being, my sister was being fitted for her dress for that wedding. The guys had been away for a while while all that was going on, and we were coming back. There was, a, there was a sidewalk that ran through the courtyard out in front of that apartment building, and those relatives of these friends had a small child. They had put up a net out in the courtyard that part of it ran across the sidewalk uh, to create a play area for that boy. Well, it was about, it was dusk in the evening as we were coming back, and so you couldn't really see, unless you knew it was there, you couldn't really notice that net. And I'm sure you're getting ahead of me by now. We, when we got back, I jumped out of the car, went running ahead of my dad, and went running down that sidewalk, and you guessed it, I hit it at full speed. I hit that net at full speed. It flipped me up in the air, and the first part of my body to make contact with the sidewalk was my chin. I still have vague, a a kind of a snapshot, quick snapshot memory of being held down in the emergency room as the doctor was trying to get to me to uh, sew up that wound in my chin. It's been 50 years, it's been over 50 years since that happened and I still have that scar from that ordeal. My wife also has scars on her body from when she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. She has one long scar from the extensive surgery that they had to do to try to clear out, clean out as much of that cancer as possible. And then there's another scar about right here where they put in a port under her skin into which they would administer the chemotherapy to treat the, uh, to do the follow-up treatments on her cancer. Um... Those wounds allowed for healing to take place in her body. And when those wounds healed, they left scars. You probably have your own stories about scars that you may have or those of family or friends of yours. You know, we can receive scars. We can, we can have scars not just physically, but emotionally, mentally, psychologically. Those who have served in the military, and especially in combat, have scars from those experiences, some of which you can't necessarily see. Sometimes we end up with scars because of accidents or things that happen to us that we didn't choose for that to happen. And then there are times that we've received scars because we did enter a situation. We did get involved in something knowing that there was, we was probably going to get hurt at the time. I'm talking about scars this morning because of these two scenes from this text from the gospel according to John after Easter, after Jesus was resurrected from the dead on Easter We're finishing up this series titled, Easter Changes Everything, and it certainly did for Jesus. He received a new body, one in which the wounds he had received were completely healed now. And in both of these scenes from this text, Jesus identifies himself by showing those scars to his disciples, his hands and his side. I want to come back to that as our focus for today, but first I want to mention some other things that happen in this text. First, notice what Jesus says to the disciples as soon as he appears to them. Peace be with you. In fact, he repeats it almost immediately. Peace 
be with you. Those who have read throughout the Gospel of John may remember something Jesus said the night before he died to those disciples. At the end of chapter 14, we read, he said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. So when he sees them again after his death and resurrection, that's the first thing he gives them, peace. And after all he'd been through that week leading up to this moment, it's amazing to me that that would be the priority on his mind at this point, this peace, this gift of peace. You see, it's one thing for any of us to to be at peace, to have peace about us, when things are going well for us and all around us. But when the chaos comes, when everyone and everything seems to turn against you, when the shouts of hatred and the the acts of injustice come, can you still be at peace? And can you still offer peace to those around you? That's the example Jesus set for his disciples. That's the first gift he gave them after he met them, after rising from the dead. Well, then John writes that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Well, that image takes a Bible reader all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, to those first stories, those creation stories there in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, we read, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. John uses that same imagery to tell us that God in Christ is still creating, breathing the life-giving spirit into these disciples. In a sense, this is John's version of what Luke tells us happened at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit is given to these disciples, birthing them as the church, the body of Christ. Jesus knows they will not have this peace that he's offering to them unless they also receive this gift of the Holy Spirit. Don't miss that, friends. When the chaos and the troubling times come for any of us, we can only have this peace that Jesus offers if we've also accepted the gift of the Holy Spirit into our lives and stay in contact with that Spirit. This Spirit would guide and empower those first disciples and still guides and empowers us for the mission. And Jesus goes on to tell what that mission is. It is the forgiveness of sins, to to offer forgiveness of sins. I mentioned last week that I believe that's one of the primary reasons that Jesus came to this earth was to to, to announce forgiveness to us. Well, here's another support for that belief. He gives the same assignment to his disciples. So again, I say to everybody listening, it's only by receiving this gift of the Holy Spirit that you will know the peace of Christ and be able to live and share the message of forgiveness. One other thing before we return to our focus for today. Thomas was no different than the other disciples in needing proof that Jesus was alive. And apparently Jesus knew that because when he first appeared to the disciples, that's the first thing he did. He showed them his hands and his side as a way of identifying himself, as a way of proving to them that it was him and he really was alive. In other words, the secret to Jesus' identity from Jesus' example is his scars. Well, let's look a little further at that and how that applies to us still today, those who seek to be his disciples. First of all, cross-bearing produces wounds. Jesus told his disciples that if they wanted to follow him, they first must deny themselves and take up their own cross. I've shared before that I believe cross-bearing is about intentionally choosing uh, to get involved in a situation, to, to maybe get involved in somebody's life, to get involved in some kind of a cause for which you know there's a good chance that you're going to get hurt by doing that. To get involved in that person's life or that family's life or that group's life 
or to get involved in that cause, you know that it's going to produce some pain. But you believe the Holy Spirit is guiding you, is compelling you, is pushing you toward getting involved there. You know that God loves that person or that family or that group or that cause. And because God loves them, you love them. And you want to show that love. And so you get involved even though you know that you could get wounded in the process. Today is Mother's Day in our country. Mothers do this all the time. They sacrifice for their children. If necessary, they're willing to bear a cross in a sense, to let their children know that they love them. My mom certainly sacrificed for me and my sister. And yet it's not me and my sister that I'm thinking about as I think about mom for this sermon. There were a number of years late in her life that she cared for three successive family members of hers in the late years of their life. First it was her aunt, then it was her mother, then it was her husband, my dad. All of that caregiving took a major toll on her health. It decreased the quality of her life late in her life. In a very real sense, she was wounded from all that caregiving. And yet if she had to do it all over again, she would. She loved each of them dearly, and she was willing to do whatever was necessary to care for them in those years. Jesus called his followers to be cross-bearers. But it's important to know that's not just about family. That's not just about bearing a cross for family or people that you like. Jesus also died. He bore a cross for his enemies as well. And he also died speaking out for injustice. I mention that in particular this morning because I feel the need to acknowledge the national wound of racism that was opened up again for us this past week. The Spirit of Christ inspires me and compels me to join my voice of protest and outrage at the killing of Ahmaud Arbery, the young black man who was shot to death jogging in his neighborhood back in February. One of the crosses that many people in our nation bear these days is to fight against so many examples of injustice that are all based in racism. Ahmad's case is just one more example of that injustice. I invite you to join me in prayer and in soul searching for all of us to, to search in our own souls for ways that we can seek healing for this deep, and complicated wound of racism. Well, that leads to a second step in our focus for today. First, we noted that cross-bearing produces wounds. But these scenes from after Easter remind us that God heals wounds. Jesus showed us that throughout his ministry that God is God's all about healing our wounds, whether they be physical or emotional or psychological or whatever. Physically, if you have a bruise, if you have a, a wound of any kind, if you have a sore, if you have a scab, then you're still dealing with the negative effects of, of whatever caused that. Um, that's also true of anything psychological or emotional. If you don't seek help for that, and, and it may be counseling that you need or whatever that you need, if you don't seek help for that wound, then you continue to deal with the negative effects for it for years later. There are too many people who carry around wounds of the past that burden them and prevent them from living life to the fullest. If you're one of those people, I encourage you to, to seek out healing from Jesus for that wound. And one of the ways you know the difference between, you see, there's a difference between wounds and scars and the effect that they have on us. If you're still talking about how hurt you are from that experience, then you've got a wound. You've got something that you're still dealing with the negative effects of it. And so I encourage you to seek healing for that wound, whatever it is. Seek healing for it. This scar under my chin most of the time, I forget about it. I don't, even, I don't even remember that it's there. But if my parents hadn't helped me get healing for that, get, get those stitches put in my chin, 
then I would have to deal with the negative effects of that for who knows how long afterward. Well, that takes us to a next step, and I've already uh, alluded to it. Healed wounds produce scars. Once complete healing has taken place, there's often a scar left behind. There's a, there's a mark, there's a reminder of what happened. I've got a friend who, who was telling me not long ago about uh, a situation that happened to him last fall. He was, he was trimming bushes for a widow lady that lives beside him. And these bushes were up high. He was up on a ladder. He was, he was trimming with a hedge trimmer. And, and as he was coming down, somehow uh, it, it slipped. He went to, to reach for the handle of the hedge trimmer with his left hand, and he slipped, and it kind of turned in his hand. And as he reached, he, he jabbed that trimmer into his, his uh, finger on his left hand. And it was a nasty cut. It, it took weeks for it to heal up. But finally it did, and he, he's got a scar there from it, but he doesn't have any negative effects from it. He doesn't, even, he doesn't even notice it, but when he looks at it, he remembers what happened. It's just that he's not got negative effects from what happened. Jesus was wounded severely, both before he went to the cross and as he hung on the cross. His body was so gashed that it was almost unrecognizable. But when he was resurrected and he had a new body, those wounds were completely healed. However, he still had the scars. And it was those scars that he used to identify himself to his disciples. I've often pointed out that Jesus wants to be remembered by the communion meal. The first time he offered that meal to his disciples, he said, every time you do this, remember me. And in that meal, when we refer to the, to the bread and to the juice or the wine, we say this is the body and the blood of Jesus. In other words, we identify Jesus by a broken and bloodied body at communion. And then Luke, Luke's the only writer that tells us the story of uh, the Easter story, the Easter I guess late morning or afternoon story of, of the two disciples who were walking out to the village known as Emmaus. And there was this stranger came and joined them on their walk. They didn't recognize who it was. And, but when they, when they got to where they were going, they invited the stranger in to come and eat with them. And there, were, there came this climactic point at which they finally recognized who it was. They knew it was Jesus when he broke the bread. Well, it's as if in the Gospel of John, this writer gets the same message across by telling us about two appearances Jesus made to his disciples after his resurrection. In both of those appearances, he identifies himself by showing his scars. So, for those who seek to be his disciples today, I believe he also lets us know what it takes to be identified as one of his. If he also called us to take up crosses, we're going to receive wounds from those crosses. And if we let God heal those wounds, we'll also receive scars. Therefore, scars identify Christians. If we follow the example of our Lord, people will know we belong to him because of our scars. It's also in this Gospel of John that we hear Jesus say the night before he died to those disciples, they will know, others will know that you are mine if you love one another. In a sense, it's almost like a math formula. When you love somebody, you make sacrifices for them. You, in a sense, carry a cross for them. You get wounded when you bear a cross and if you let healing take place for those wounds, you end up with scars. So love equals a cross, equals wounds, equals healing, equals scars. So if Christians are identified by the love of Christ, it follows that we'll be identified by scars. The Bible tells us that the wounds of Jesus, that by the wounds of Jesus we are healed. By his stripes we are healed, the scriptures say. 
Our sins are forgiven. We are offered new life in Christ. I invite you to give thanks for this new life offered to you in Jesus Christ and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit who will guide you and empower you to share this new life. Please understand, you will receive some scars in the process. But those, you see, hey, those are the marks by which you're identified as belonging to Jesus. Thanks be to God for his scars and for those of so many who allow him to still live in them today. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, we give you thanks. We are in awe of your scars, of your willingness to be wounded on our behalf of your willingness to be wounded such that you showed us what this life of sharing your love and forgiveness looks like. Guide us to be willing to show your love to others, even when it means taking up a cross, knowing that we might be wounded, we probably will be, but that you heal wounds. And those scars show that we belong to you. Help us be your people. Thank you for the scars that allow us to do so. In Jesus' name, amen. We'd like to ask you to register attendance now. If you would just take out your tablet or your smartphone and open the app. There's a tab at the very bottom right in the center called Get Connected, if you'll touch that. A sheet opens up where you can, one of the choices is register your attendance. If you have a prayer request, there's a place for that under notes. As Willie and Barbara sing this beautiful song, now we come to this time of offering. I would invite you to go online and make your contribution, or if you are writing a check, go ahead and do that now. This offering is part of our worship, and it helps us to be part of God's ministry in the world, whether it's helping victims of tornadoes, whether it's helping provide free medical care at the Volunteers and Medicine Clinic, caring for children at the Bethlehem Center, wherever we're called to serve, our offerings help us to do that in a powerful way. Thank you. God, thank you so much for being my healer. And just overwhelming me with your spirit, Jesus. Give us the peace that we know you can give us.
yet signed on with Jesus, I invite you to do so. If you've not yet chosen to follow him, to learn from him, to be one of his, to be identified with him, I invite you to do so. And if there's any way that we can be of help to the, in that, please contact us, email us, call us, let us know, and we'd be glad to do so. Certainly, if you're looking for a place to unite in mission and ministry, if you're looking to get connected, help uh, let us know, and we want to help you get connected here at Christ Church. We welcome again Michael Rogers, who comes to share with us that song that talks of, Jesus, uh, of God's amazing grace.
If that does not inspire you, please check your pulse. Go be the people of Christ. Go share that amazing grace. Go live your praises of God each day. Be the people of Christ. Amen.